Genesis, picking up this morning at verse 30. I've entitled this particular message, Fear, Failure, and God's Faithfulness. And I do think it's going to hit home for some of us immediately. There will be people, some of us here today, that God is going to greatly encourage, lift the burden, remove that veil of the unknown and the fear that accompanies it, and say, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For others, you're going to say, well, it's really not my deal. I'm not really afraid of anything. Well, maybe not today. But I guarantee you that God never wastes His Word. And so if He's bringing it before us, He wants us to pay close attention to it. What happens in this section and then the chapter that follows is basically two stories. Both of them focus on fear and failure. But there are contrasting conclusions. And what we're going to see is in the first, there's a legacy, Lot's legacy, of bad choices leading to devastating consequences. Lot was a man who walked by sight and not by faith. And if you've been following the story with us, you know that God had blessed him even as he had Abraham. He knew the Lord. And yet, rather than dwell Apart from the world, with the Lord, he moved toward the fertile plains of Sodom. He moved into Sodom. He moved up in Sodom and eventually had to be rescued from Sodom as God came to destroy that city and the cities surrounding it. And that's sort of where we were left last time. Lot rescued, but here's the deal. As he was being rescued, if you weren't here with us, he began to negotiate with his rescuers the terms of where he'd end up. And all of this was motivated by fear. They said, flee to the mountains. This whole valley is going to be destroyed. He said, I'm afraid to go to the mountains. He goes, couldn't I just go to Zoar? It's just a little town. Sort of the thought is, it couldn't be nearly as bad as some of these big cities. Well, I live in Durham. I don't know where you live, but I found that little cities are just the same as big cities. Every wickedness in L.A. is here. Every wickedness in San Francisco is here. Every wickedness in London is here. And yes, it's a smaller population, so maybe in not as great of numbers. But Lot thought that he could escape the wickedness and the judgment on it by going to this little town of Zoar. Now we find, ironically enough, that having come to Zoar, when he sees the destruction of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities of the valley... Now he's afraid to stay in Zoar. Why? He looks around and he realizes, man, these are just like the people back there in Sodom. There's no difference. It's just a bunch more sinners. So instead of staying, he now, for fear, flees to the mountains. He finds himself living in a cave. And for those of you who've ever thought, man, if I could just get away entirely, if I could just live in a cave with my family, we're going to find it doesn't always work out so well. That's exactly what he does. He gets that monastery mentality. I'll just separate myself entirely now. But he should have separated himself long before. Well, as the story picks up, we see the major difference in these two people, Lot and Abraham. His Lot has a legacy of fear and failure. Abraham, on the other hand, has a rather often on serious lapse of faith. Now, God deals with both, but what you'll see is different, is that Abraham always is rebuked. He's always brought to repentance. He's always restored. He was a friend of God. He walked by faith and from time to time fell for fear and to sin. Lot walked by sight and from time to time, and we really don't see much of it ourselves, from time to time, must have walked by faith because Peter tells us, and if it weren't for Peter, we'd have no clue that Lot was a righteous man. Well, our story picks up then in the mountains. Lot with his two daughters, there in verse 30. And the firstborn gets an idea, verse 31. Our father's old. There's no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of the earth. 
Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him and preserve the lineage of our father. Now, I want you to see, Lot's in his predicament because of fear, and fear has led to failure. Not just personally, but in discipling his own children and teaching them right from wrong and implementing or, or, or info, giving them um, good moral values. They have bought into the lie of Sodom that you can live however you want and somehow come out fine. Well, in that day, it was a real disaster to not carry on the family line. And in that day, it was a real disaster for a woman to not bear a child. But because Lot wasn't walking by faith, his daughters weren't walking by faith. And it's the responsibility of those of us in positions of leadership to walk by faith. So if people don't see anything else in us, they see that. They see that we believe God, that we trust God, that we obey God, that we wait on the Lord. And that's what Lot failed to do. And now we see his daughters do the very same thing. They come up with this horrendous plan. They say, let's just get Pop drunk, and then when he's drunk, we can lie with him and at least preserve his lineage, at least keep the family name going. Now, I worked in the bars for eight years, and I want to tell you, I never saw one good thing come out of drunkenness. I can't remember one time where I saw somebody get drunk and thought, well, they're doing much better in that state. And it's important for us to, to realize that when the Bible talks about the importance of our relationship to God, the Holy Spirit. He actually contrasts this new reality with drunkenness. And here's a couple of reasons why. When a person is drunk, inebriated with alcohol, their speech is impacted, affected. They slur their words. They stammer when they speak, often speaking perverse and bizarre things that they're shocked themselves come out of their mouths. When people are drunk, it's not just their words, but their walk is affected and impacted. They stumble around instead of walking straight. The Bible tells us, of course, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's a heart problem. And they begin to look on others in a perverse or ungodly or immoral way. And so observing all that, knowing the Scripture says not to be drunk with wine, and then says instead be being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to share something with you that's very profound. Perhaps you've already thought through that comparison. When we're filled with God the Holy Spirit, we're not just getting a substance to take the place of the wine. No, God the Holy Spirit is not just a substance, not just an influence, not just there to make us feel better or get through. We're talking about being filled with to overflowing with God Himself. It's incredible to me that any believer would choose wine when it can be God. Now, I have heard people, and maybe this is why, I've heard people refer to the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, as an it, as if He were some force or some power or some influence. Listen, God the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is God, the Holy Spirit. So when he says be filled with the Spirit, he's saying be filled to overflowing with God. Let God guide, direct, impact, speak through you. Let your word build up and encourage and edify. Let your walk glorify and be a model for others. Let your heart, instead of perversity, be filled with love and patience and kindness and goodness and joy toward God and man. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then every part of us is going to be impacted. And every person around us will be impacted. Now, I won't say who, but I have a friend relatively close. And uh, he had a baby coming not that long ago. This doesn't bust him because so many babies born regularly here. But I noticed him calling his baby in it. Well, I wasn't born yet. He didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. But I said, you know, it really isn't an it. it it's a little person. Why don't you just say, my child or my soon-to-be baby? Don't call people it, and don't call God for sure it. Well, why is that important? Because people get the idea that somehow God wants to just substitute Himself 
for our old lifestyle. Listen, there is nothing in our old lives that can compare with this new life. There's nothing we experienced, nothing we did, nothing we accomplished that can come close to simply yielding ourselves and saying, Lord, fill and use me. Now, if you come from a theological background where you were taught that when you gave your life to the Lord, when you were born again, if in fact you've come that far, you got all of God you're ever going to get. Listen, to be sealed with the Spirit is to be is to have God the Holy Spirit indwelling you permanently. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is more. It's yielding yourself completely, letting God have total control. And if I were to ask you right now, how many of you know for a fact you're absolutely sure you're born again, most of you would raise your hands. How many of you know, if any man hath not the Spirit of God, he's none of his? Most of you would raise your hands. But if I were to say, how many of you have an abundant life in Him, are just experiencing ongoing, overflowing, ever-abundant joy and peace? How many of your lives are radically impacted and impacting others? Far fewer hands would be raised. Thus the need to be controlled by, led by, taught by, directed by God, the Holy Spirit. The Scripture calls that being filled with the Spirit. Well, Lot certainly wasn't. His daughters get this ill-conceived plan. They get him drunk. They sleep with him. They produce offspring. In the latter part of the chapter, they name the first son Moab, the second son Ammon. And as you read the history of Israel, and we'll be doing that as we continue our study through the Old Testament, you will find that both the Ammonites and the Moabites were a real thorn in the side of the Israelites. This wasn't just a local problem that was dealt with and put away. But later, when the Moabites, much later in history, see the children of Israel who are not yet even in existence, camped on their border, Balak calls for Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. And ultimately, the Moabites lead the children of Israel into immorality and idolatry. The very thing that was taking place in that cave carried on from generation to generation to generation. And we find them a stumbling block through the ages to the Israelites. Now, Abraham, on the other hand, and at least his story has a happy ending, journeyed from the south. He dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, sojourning in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, verse 2 of chapter 20, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, a couple of things. Some commentators reading this story imagine that it must just be a sort of a verbal tradition with some, you know, changes because this actually happened 24 years earlier back in Egypt. But I want to suggest to you that there are too many differences for these to be the same stories. And those who say, well, maybe it's just, you know, a little confusion in the people and the places, no. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired this. He preserved it. And He's sharing it with us today through the written Word. Why? Because He wants us to see in Abraham that even a walk of faith, even a friend of God, even real worshipers, even real witnesses can occasionally and will certainly have a lapse of faith. That's what's happening here. Now, it shouldn't escape us that it's the very same type of situation that he failed in 24 years earlier. And you'd think by now, this father of the faith, this friend of God would have figured it out. God has been faithful to him. He's protected him. He's preserved him. He's provided for him. He finds himself under a similar stress that he'd experienced much earlier and he reverts to the same behavior, the same ungodly behavior that he'd reverted to in earlier times. In doing so, he misrepresented the Lord. In doing so, he stumbled a pagan king. In doing so, he put his wife at risk 
In doing so, he impacted the wives of all of the people of Abimelech. For we'll find at the end of the chapter, God closes up their wombs. There is no reproduction until this issue is dealt with. There's no fruit until this sin is dealt with. And I believe what's happening here is that God led him to this place so the sin could come to the surface, so it could be dealt with once and for all, because God had great plans for Abraham. Now, here's how this applies to you. Here's how this applies to me. It may be that you've been walking with the Lord for quite a while now. I know some of you have. I know some of you are brand new at all of this. Just hang with us a second. Some of you who've walked with the Lord for years and years, dealt with things in the past, thought, man, I've conquered that, I've overcome that, that's past history. You need to know, the Bible says, be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. Don't fall into the sin of pride and complacency, thinking you can't be tempted in ways you were tempted earlier. And I think that some of us are greatly disturbed greatly discouraged, greatly disappointed in ourselves when we find ourselves going back, sliding back, repeating the sins of the past and thinking, I haven't made any progress at all. It's not true. You've made lots of progress. And like Abraham, if this isn't a lifestyle and just a lapse, you will be confronted today, some of you. You will be rebuked. Today, some of you, not by me, but by God's Word. And then you will be convicted. You'll repent. You'll be restored. You'll be set right. And then God will begin to work miraculously. There'll be fruit. There'll be reproduction. There'll be all God's intended and that's hindered because of that underlying, undealt with sin. So, God, we see, is perfectly able to deal with anyone at any time. I hope you know that. Theologically, the term is that he is sovereign. That means he can do anything he wants at any time. No, God doesn't always force the issue, but he can. And in this case, Abraham blows it. Sarah's at risk. God steps right in, and I want you to note how he does it. He just appears to this guy, this pagan king, in a dream and says, you are dead, man. You have taken another man's wife. If you have, haven't been disturbed enough by the, the uh, drunkenness part, know this. Adultery is so serious to God biblically that even before the law, he says, that'll kill you. I'll kill you for it. You'll die spiritually. You'll die physically. You'll die reproductively. He is saying, Man, you are dead. You've taken another man's wife. God has always held the marriage relationship in the highest of esteem. Why? He created it. Wasn't man's institution. In fact, they did a wedding last night and I shared with them and I'll share it with you. I don't think men would have ever thought up marriage. I don't think so. Maybe women, but not men. But God not only thought it up, He instituted, He ordained it, and He blesses it. And He says, man, don't let sexual immorality be named among you. Now, that was the deal last time. And if you weren't here, you might want to pick up the tape. If you don't want to be convicted and busted by it, then don't. But if you want to deal with those issues and think it might help, then do. Well, anyway, God comes to him in a dream, and God can speak to anyone, anywhere, anytime, however He chooses. There are some teaching that unless we pray, God can't move. Unless we speak, God can't save. Unless we, God can't listen. God will never put himself at our mercy. He is sovereign completely over all his creation. He is almighty, all powerful. Now, I do delight in the fact that he chooses to speak through me. I'm amazed by it. I'm humbled by it. I never think, well, of course he uses me. Because I've read the story of Balaam and Balak and know he can speak to a donkey and it isn't the only time he ever did. But I am amazed and in awe and just so appreciative that not only will God forgive sinners like us, not only will he let us make it to heaven, but he in the process and in the meantime says, look, I take your life and I'll use it in profound and wonderful and radical ways. That's our hope. 
And even if you've fallen, even if you've stumbled, even if you've had a life of just blowing it completely, there's hope today. Why? You're here. You're here in the truth. You're opening your heart so God can work. So, words of comfort and hope. God comes in a dream. He says, man, you're dead. And then, Abimelech begins to plead his case. He had not come near her, we read in verse 4, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Now, I don't know for sure if Abraham was able to listen into this conversation, but this had to be interesting if he did. Because those were Abraham's words to God before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And what Abimelech is saying is, look, these people didn't do anything wrong. He's not saying they weren't sinners. He's saying, I sinned. Okay. But what did they do? And God's saying, okay. And then I want you to see what else he has to say. He pleads the nation's righteousness, his own ignorance and innocence. He says, did he not say to me, verse 5, she is my sister. And she even herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, that's a verse I have highlighted. That's a verse I have underlined. And here's why. Of all the things we're going to read and consider together today, that verse tells me, tells you, God is able to keep us from sinning. He is able to keep that which has been committed to Him. Listen, Abimelech wasn't even serving the Lord. And God could speak to him in a dream. God could restrain him from sinning. Now, you might be thinking, well, there certainly have been times he didn't. Well, yeah, of course. There are times where he lets us make the choice to reveal what's in our heart. Why? He wants us to make the right choice. He's not looking for robots. He's looking for people that respond to Him in love, that recognize His love and grace and mercy. So He allows a choice. But listen, He's still sovereign. And if you make the wrong choice and He decides, no, I'm not going to let that happen. Believe me, He'll have His way. If you don't know it, read the story of Jonah. He did everything he could get away only to be vomited onto the shores of the very place he could have gone the easy way, but he didn't. Look at Pharaoh who says, who's the Lord that I should obey him? He says, I'll show you who I am. And as Pharaoh hardens his heart, God strengthens him in that conviction and demonstrates his power in and through him. So you can say, I won't do the will of God. And if God decides you will, you will. But I'll tell you what God will not force you to do. He will not force you into a relationship with Him that demands a response of love. He will not force you into heaven. And some people think, well, it's just not right. Everyone won't make it to heaven. Consider for a moment. If all the people on the planet made it to heaven, it would be no different than here. We don't want people who don't want to be there complaining that, hey, this isn't what I signed up for. I, I wanted to be in hell with my friends. You see the album covers, you know. You know what they're talking about. Well, the bottom line here is that God is able to keep us from sinning. So that means, for one thing, as believers, we have no excuse. We can't say, well, I thought God was going to keep me. He warns us. Big flashing signs, do not enter, don't go, danger ahead, roadblock. we got to walk over all of it, trample on the cross to get there. And then we turn around and say, why did you let this happen, Lord? How foolish can we be? Having been forewarned, how foolish can we be? Well, in Abimelech's case, it didn't matter that he wasn't walking with the Lord or perhaps even aware of the Lord. God still restrained him from sin. How much more will he restrain you and restrain me? If we say, Lord, I don't want to sin. I don't want to stumble my kids. I don't want to stumble my wife. I don't want to stumble my friends. I want to be a witness for you. He will be faithful. So Abimelech says, man, I was innocent. And 
and I acted in integrity. They lied to me. And so he says in verse 7, Well, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. And he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know all, know that you shall surely die and all who are yours. God says, you deal now or you will surely die. And I want to tell you, God offers every person on this planet forgiveness of sin. There's nobody going to be in hell because God didn't give them opportunity to hear the good news and to repent. You might be thinking, well, what about the aborigines or what about the people way over somewhere? If that's a genuine concern of your heart and not just a smokescreen to keep from dealing with your own sin, then come to the Lord, train in the ministry and go share with them. See, there's opportunity. We'll even help pay your way. But God doesn't have to send you. He can speak to them. In a dream, he could speak to them through a burning bush. He could speak to them through a donkey. He can do it however he sees fit. But I guarantee you, not one person is going to end up in hell and say, I never knew. And no one here is going to stand before God and say, no one ever told me. There is forgiveness of sin at the foot of the cross. Jesus, we're told, died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. From the cross, He prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that prayer extends down through the ages. So, God speaks to Abimelech in a dream. And He says, look, I've restrained you. And as Abraham had earlier judged Abimelech as probably some pagan with no morals and they're just going to take my wife and kill me. No, no doubt Abimelech's beginning to look at Abraham like, yeah, Here's a real man of God, a liar, a hypocrite, gets me in all this trouble, messes with my whole kingdom. And I want you to see how God defends his man in spite of Abraham's sin. He says, restore the man's wife, verse 7, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore, you will die, you and all who are yours. God speaks highly of Abraham. Why? Because that's who he was making, Abraham. That was the call in Abraham's life. Did he falter? Yes. Was he a hypocrite? Yes. Did he sin? Absolutely. But it was a lapse and not a lifestyle. And so, he says, hey, he's a prophet and he is the road to healing in this situation. He will pray for you. And you will be healed. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, verse 8, calls all his servants, told them all these things in the hearing, and the men were very afraid. Do you see the fear? First Lot's afraid. Failure. Then his daughters are afraid. Failure. Then Abraham's afraid. Failure. Now Abimelech's people are afraid. But God's in a process of restoration. And they're very afraid. So Abimelech called Abraham and said, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Now I'll tell you, it is a bummer to be falsely accused. If it ever happens to you, you know it is so painful to have people speak ill of you, to tell lies about you. But Jesus said, blessed are you when you're falsely accused, when they speak all manner of against you falsely for my sake. But I'll tell you what's worse than being falsely accused, and that's being rightly accused. Especially if you're being accused by pagans. If you're being accused by unbelievers. And if it happens to you, or if it's happened to you, you know just what I'm talking about. When they're like, hey, I thought Christians were supposed to be honest. I thought Christians were supposed to be loving. I thought Christians were supposed to forgive. And you know, when people say that to you, your old nature comes up. The hair goes up on the back of your head and you're like, oh yeah, and you've got, you know, you pull out your little card that says Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Yeah, read right here, you know. We're not perfect, just forgiven. But, but see, that's kind of what was happening with Abraham. He was reverting back and we can't revert back. You know what we need to tell people when they catch us in sin and rebuke us for it? You know what? You're absolutely right. I should have never lied. I should have never stole. I should have never cheated. I should have never played the hypocrite. Will you forgive me 
for being such a poor witness to you. And I want you to know that I'm going to pray to the Lord and He is going to forgive me and will restore me. And I hope I get another opportunity to show you what a real Christian is. See, when we cop to it, it's over. When we confess it, it's a done deal. But if you justify it, if you rationalize it, if you try to make excuses for it, it just goes on and on and on. And I want you to see, Abraham hadn't done here. He says, what were you thinking? What in the world was going on in your mind there in verse 10? And he said, well, I I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they'll kill me on account of my wife. He says, I thought in fear of the unknown, fear of what we are not sure of, often leads us to failure, to sin. He says, I just didn't know. I figured you guys were just a bunch of pagan, heathen, murderers, you know, take my wife, kill me kind of guys. And I want to encourage you that not everybody you work with that isn't a Christian is like that. You know, you can walk with the Lord for a while and begin to imagine because you've grown so much, you're so much better than them. And I want to tell you today, you're not better than them at all. Just better off. That's all. The grace of God has brought salvation to those of us who believe. But we're not better than the people who've yet to believe. And when we judge them as unworthy of the gift God's given us, we're doing the very thing Abraham did to Abimelech. And the thing Abimelech, no doubt, was at this point doing to Abraham. Abraham's looking and saying, I just thought you were a bunch of murderers. And Abimelech's saying, man, I didn't know you God followers were liars and, you know, all of that. So... We're told that there was two more excuses offered. First, I just thought you guys would kill me. Then it says, indeed, verse 12, truly she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. He rendered a half-truth. Somebody told me years ago, I want to share with you, a half-truth is a whole lie. It's like being a little bit pregnant. There just ain't no such thing. You are or you ain't. And uh, there is no such thing as a half-truth. You are either telling the truth or you're lying. You are either honest or dishonest. We'd like to think we could walk in some gray area between. But God says there's a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness, and light and darkness have nothing in common. They don't mix in some gray area. You make right decisions and walk in the light as He is in the light. Or you walk in darkness. That's the only decision and choices and options. So he says, well, you know, I thought you were a bunch of murderous heathen. And and anyway, it's sort of, you know, half true. And then his third excuse is, well, we planned this a long time ago. I want you to see it. He says, it came to pass, verse 13, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go. Say of me, he is my brother. He says, we made this deal 24 years ago. Isn't that sad? He said, you know, when God first called me, what was his status then? He was a full-blown pagan like everyone else. He was just getting to know the Lord. And he said, I kind of made a decision back then how I would deal with these kinds of pressures later on. And I want to tell you, if you have foolishly done the same, reverted back, to how you dealt with things before you knew better. Well, you can change all that today. You can say, Lord, I don't want to walk in hypocrisy. I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to go the way of Abraham here. Well, Abimelech deals with all of this. Took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, gives them to Abraham, verse 14. Restores Sarah, his wife, to him. And he says, see, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And to Sarah, he said, behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before all others. So she was reproved. And Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, his maidservants, and they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. I want you to see again three things. First, Lot's lifestyle of walking by sight instead of faith not only caused him the loss of all he valued and treasured, but led to the loss of his own daughters. 
sense of virtue and morality led to that despicable scene in that cave that led to the birth of those who would ultimately be enemies and ensnarers of God's chosen people. Immorality and idolatry abounded. Abraham, on the other hand, had lapses of faith, and yet God would rebuke him here through a pagan king. He would restore him, and God still called him a prophet, still said, hey, have him pray for you. I'll honor that prayer. And I pray today, if any of us have fallen as Abraham did for fear, and that was what was going on, Listen, there are so many things that we brought into this Christian experience. Things we were afraid of. Things that we were fearful might at some point happen. I'll tell you, the reality is never as bad as the fear itself. Those things we greatly fear, if God allows them in our life, He will be with us in them. And He'll sustain us through them. He'll show Himself faithful in the midst of them. So, for unbelievers, the question is simple. And this is my third and final thing. If you have had a lifestyle of sin, do you recognize and realize today there is hope for you? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here at all. God's drawn you that you might hear the truth and the truth will set you free. And here's the truth. That you are a sinner and alienated from a holy God. The God who created you who sustained you, who loves you, who sent His Son Jesus to die for you. He has sustained you to this point, And He's offering you complete and total pardon of sin. He wipes your slate clean. And if you're thinking, well, that's just a little too easy for me. I mean, there must be something I've got to do. Yeah, there is. You've got to believe it and receive it. And I'll tell you, pride will keep you from it. You might say, well... I don't even know that I am a sinner. Trust me, you are. If you're not absolutely sure and you say, well, how do you know? Ask anyone you know. They'll tell you. You are a sinner. But God loves sinners. We see that. And He chooses and uses sinners and He restores fallen sinners. And He wants to forgive you and wipe your slate clean today. If you are a believer and for fear or any other reason you found yourself in sin, misrepresenting the Lord, playing the hypocrite, falling back into your old patterns. Today, you can confess that and be forgiven and set free. Romans 6 says we are free from the power of sin and death. We need to latch on to that reality. So, Lord, I pray first for my brothers and sisters. And I'm certain for some, this will be a day of restoration. And Lord, You're the one who knows our hearts, knows our true condition. We see one another stumble and falter. We hear things from one another that aren't exactly words of faith and encouragement. We watch one another stumble and slip up. And and we're well aware, Lord, that there are heart problems if there are outward problems. But I pray, Lord, today we wouldn't be judging our neighbor, but we'd be judging ourselves. And we confess before you, Lord, that we haven't spoken well always and we haven't walked straight always. And Lord, I pray that this would be a day of confrontation lovingly and restoration completely. And Lord, as my brothers and sisters are considering their own condition, their own needs for confession, repentance, Restoration. I pray for any and all here who've never given their lives to You, who perhaps, Lord, have lived a religious life and thought that must be good enough, or perhaps lived completely outside of any knowledge of You or any desire for You. Lord, today we know You're about bringing them to faith in You. And I pray that You, by Your Holy Spirit, would come alongside. You'll convict them of sin that they've sinned against You, a holy God, of righteousness that none have met Your righteous standard, of judgment to come, that unless they repent, Lord, they'll pay the penalty for their sin. And I'm going to ask the worship team to return, and as they do, I want to give you an opportunity, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, to pray and do that very thing. And I'd ask you to take a step of faith and raising your hand and say, Sam, pray for me. 
I do believe Jesus died for my sins, and I don't know what's kept me, but right now I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus. If that's you, and you've never before opened your heart to Him, never before confessed your need for Him, I'd ask you to raise your hand, to hold it high, and I'll pray for you. I'm only talking to those of you who've never given your life to the Lord Jesus. God bless you. I see your hand there, and I see your hand there as well. Others here, this service, this hour, if the Lord's spoken to you as well, listen, this is really about you and Him. I'm just here for a point of contact. Anybody else want to join these who've raised their hand and say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me my sins. I want to be born again of Your Spirit, cleansed of all unrighteousness, forgiven every sin. Anyone else? If so, let me see your hand. Lord, we search for hands. You search our hearts. And I pray as these two have indicated their desire to know your forgiveness, that, Lord, you will not only forgive them as you've promised, but as you seal them now with your Holy Spirit, you'd fill them as well, Lord, that they could experience not just that sense of purity and cleansing and complete restoration, but, Lord, that exhilaration of knowing that You're going to use them as powerful witnesses for You. That they're not going to go out in their own energies or strength trying to do anything, Lord, but they're going to go out empowered by You to say that You are a forgiving and a merciful and a gracious God. And you who raise your hand and any others who want to pray along, I want you to pray this prayer aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank You for choosing me, for drawing me here today, for revealing my need for You and Your love for me and your plan for my salvation. I believe Jesus died for my sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again. And I receive that forgiveness He promised. And I thank You that I'm new in You, cleansed completely, forgiven entirely, a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Family. We have a